afternoon, everybody. Is everyone, everyone ready to go? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. It is. You can, you, sorry? No? Good. You can ask me questions afterwards. Um, all right. Hey, everybody. Uh, how's it going? I'm Nick. I'm one of the third year students at Cabrini. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about OSCEs. Um, yeah, so we'll get cracking. I think uh, if we could start off with this. So if you guys have a pen and paper, just get that out and we'll just start with a quick scenario and then we can move on from that. So go for your lights. Go 30 more seconds. And we'll wrap it up there. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you guys uh, by this point have a sort of uh, a format of how you like to approach histories. Um, so I think I sort of put this together the other day. Hopefully this, like this, this is the way I'd sort of do it going into an OSCE. Um, of course, like a lot messier than that. My handwriting's not usually that good. Um, but anyway, so you can, you know, get the name, age, occupation at the top. Uh, presenting complaint, then break that down into WWQQ. Get your systems in a nice little area and then all the other stuff down the bottom as well. Um, so it's good to just get in the habit of uh, having a format that works that you can do every time and that you're used to, so you just know a straight where to go. So pretending that I'm Janice, um, ask me a few questions as you would in a history. Just ask them out. What's your degree today, Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've got this really sore pain just over here. I don't know, just yell them out. Go. About four days. Uh, it has got a little bit worse, yeah. Uh, it is there a lot of the time. Yeah. Oh, a little bit round to the side, but not so much. Did anything happen four days ago that might have caused it? Not particularly, no, it just sort of came on. Pretty sore all the time. Uh, sort of over here, so I can write up a quadrant. <laughs> we'll just take a couple more. Uh, look, it is pretty constant. Sometimes after I eat a meal, it gets a bit worse. Um, do you like really greasy stuff, particularly? <laughs> There's a buzzer. Hey. Yeah, there has been a little bit. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's good enough. <laughs> so, after you've taken the history, uh, you get the following information. So, Janet Ferguson, 45-year-old female. Uh, you guys probably... I don't think I said that before. You could have asked that. Um, uh, presents with acute abdo pain, nausea and vomiting for about four days. Uh, it's right up the quadrant, but sort of radiates a bit to the side. Uh, it's, about, it's pretty severe, 9 out of 10, and it's quite a sharp pain um, that gets worse after meals sometimes. Other symptoms she experiences are like nausea, vomiting, fevers, rigors, um, and then thinks it could be the liver, not too sure. Uh, so once you get to your systems reviews, you're thinking, of course, abdo, and then a few other things as well. Um, so having gone through the GI systems review, uh, positive findings are that a decreased appetite, which you know happens when you're sick, that's pretty standard. Uh, of course, abdo pain, and then jaundice as well. So she's had quite dark urine, pale stool, uh, although her bowel habits themselves have been pretty normal, and then there's a fever as well. Uh, you've excluded uh, all of the cardio um, <coughs> systems review to exclude any AMI or anything like that, and you've sort of touched on a, a couple other systems as well. In terms of her past history, there isn't really much significant there. Uh, family history, <coughs> again, not too much. Um, Socially, she's quite a busy lady. She works a lot. Uh, she's quite busy with the kids and therefore doesn't eat a great diet and eats a lot of takeaway, uh, which means you know, she's uh, perhaps put on a little bit of weight as well. So in terms of differentials, what would you guys be thinking at this point? Yell out a couple. Cholestitis. Cholestitis, yeah. Any others? Cholestitis. Cholestitis, yeah, nice. Give me like one more. Pancreatitis, cool. Yeah, very good. So um, the differentials I sort of thought for this one would be in, if you look in the top right corner there, uh, would be things like ascending cholangitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis of like a gallstone type origin, and then uh, look potentially hepatitis as well, but uh, less likely. Um, so then going from here, what investigations would you order? Function. LFTs. LFTs, yeah, nice. FBA, cool, yeah. Your analysis, yeah, good. <coughs> One more. All right. the sound of the gallbladder. Yeah, great, really good. Um, so, in terms of the investigations, uh, you can sort of break it up into three categories, which helps you remember how you should approach, uh, how you should be approaching this. So you can uh, break it up into bedside. So ECG, for example, where you'd want to exclude things like an AMI. Then you get to bloods. So look, in second year, if you are required to give investigations, it's more just like real off, FBE, LFT, UEC, etc. Um, but it is helpful to know why you're doing these things. So for an FBE, you'd be looking for things like infection. Uh, LFT, you know, assessing the nature and the severity of the pathology, seeing what's going on there. Uh, UEC could help assess the severity of the illness as well. CRP, see if there's inflammation of any sort. And blood cultures could tell you if there's a bacteremia as well. Um, and of course, abdo ultrasound is a great one to do in this instance. But if you said abdo CT, I'm sure you'd be able to get away with that as well. Now, presenting cases. Uh, this isn't something you've got, you guys have done as much this year, um, but occasionally you will be required to present in an OSCE. So it's a really handy skill to just practice a few times. Uh, to try and, the reason that these little stars are here is to try and motivate you guys a little bit. Um, you know, we've all been to primary school, we've all had like teachers bribing us with stuff. So I thought I'd just bribe you guys too. Um, so if somebody wants to come up the front here, and quickly present the case back in a minute or so. I've got some little St. Ali's coffee vouchers, if anyone wants a free coffee. <laughs> so, first one up gets it. <laughs> wow, you guys really don't like coffee? <laughs> up to that? Do you want to come down? Can I take your notes so that you write up for the history? I'll cover them up. But <laughs> and in the meantime, just think about... Uh, Think about the things that you'd say if you were to present this case back. Oh, you're covering them up. <laughs> That's right.
just the main points. Okay, so um, Jane, someone, is a 45-year-old female. Um, I, I missed all the rest of the That's all good. Females, um, presenting with a four-day history of right upper quadrant um, abdominal pain, which radiates to the side. Um, described as sharp and not nine out of ten. Um, worsens upon eating a greasy meal. Associated symptoms include nausea, vomiting, fever, and rigors. Um, didn't get any other past medical history. Yep. Was relevant or drugs? Anything? <coughs> um, I forgot what systems reviews things were given. That's okay. Cool. Did, did she appear jaundiced at all? Uh, a little bit. She was a little bit jaundiced. Um, she had pale stools, I believe. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. I would, I, I would say what um, significant negative things. I'd probably mm -hmm. comment on allergies, but I did not get enough information from that slide in so, order to comment on. Yep, that. I actually didn't have that. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so um, as, as a differential diagnosis, mm -hmm. we're looking at cholecystitis or cholangitis, possibly hepatitis or pancreatitis. Yep. Um, and then preliminary investigations, they want to do exactly what you said before. Okay. Very so, good. <laughs> this is all yours. Enjoy. Okay, so I've put together a quick little summary uh, on presentation for you guys on how you present this case. So the most important thing with presenting a case is to get that first sentence just spot on. Because essentially what you want to be doing is you want to be summarising the entire patient in one single sentence so that the examiner can know what's happening. So a way you could do that is, you know, Janet Ferguson's a previously well 45-year-old female presenting to ED with four days of severe right upper quadrant pain, nausea and vomiting, fever and jaundice. At this point, my provisional diagnosis is ascending cholangitis. From here on, you can go a bit more into the history and say why you believe it is this differential, why not, and relative positives and negatives that you've got from your history. After that, you can give a bit of an impression. So give your differentials about three or fours, which is generally a pretty safe number. And then after that, you can talk a bit about your management, uh, uh, including like investigations or any treatment. Um, I mean, like, management's a little bit more of a third year thing, but if you can chuck it in there if you have time, it's probably a really useful thing to be doing. Okay, so bring watches to your OSCEs. Um, what I tried to do is I made a bit of a survey for the third years and wanted to just send in advice on, you know, advice that they'd want to give you guys. So. Uh, yeah, in terms of bringing a watch, uh, this is something I really found helpful during OSCEs. Like the first day, I had a watch, but I forgot to use it, which is pretty stupid of me. Um, and, you know, it, I, I really struggled with that, getting the timing right. But then using it the second day made it heaps, heaps easier. So th this is something I'd, yeah, really recommend. So what to expect for OSCEs? You know, you've got your two days, four stations each. Uh, last year, what we had was uh, two histories, an exam and a procedure on the first day and then one history, two exams, and an explanation on the second. So that gives you an idea of um, where the waiting is, I guess, for the, for the OSCEs. So um, I, I get you guys have got the pre-lecture slides. There are quite a few slides. Uh, I don't plan on going into every single one in detail. A lot of them are just there for your reference, so you can read back on them later. I guess the things I want to focus on the most here are the things that aren't taught as well, in the, or not, not as well, but in, in as much detail in the course. And also, um, just handy little hints and tips that I've learned along the way that uh, you can use to sort of approach uh, taking histories or examinations or, or things like that. So we'll start with history taking. Um, these are the histories that you're expected to be able to take. Of course, you know, with overlap between them, uh, between the different systems reviews, but uh, you should be familiar with, with uh, every single one of these. Um, and in terms of the format, again, this is something you guys know well, so I don't really need to go into it. Um, one thing I could highlight, I think, is just when you ask about drugs, make sure to ask about compliance. Because I know in the past um, uh, there have been things like, you know, a patient can be taking drugs, but they're still symptomatic. Why is that they're, like, they've been prescribed drugs, but they're not actually taking them. Um, so it's really, really important to ask about that. Practicing groups, it's a great way to do it. <laughs> um, okay, and also in terms of going through the histories, this I'm not listing the entire history that you need to ask. Uh, it's just certain questions that you can ask and ways that you can remember them as well. So hopefully that, that helps you guys. Um, I take it you guys might have seen this mnemonic before for the MSK history. Uh, spills with DJs. Um, it's all pretty self-explanatory. 
Uh, yeah, there's not really <laughs> much else to that one, to be honest. Uh, in terms of the MSK history, something I'd like to focus on a little bit more is this idea of, um, uh, of stiffness, and, and morning stiffness in particular. Because this is something that can be used to differentiate osteoarthritis from inflammatory arthropathies, such as rheumatoid, etc. So, characteristically, uh, osteoarthritis has morning stiffness of less than 30 minutes, and more importantly, it gets worse after activity, which you can imagine, because it's like bone rubbing on bone, and then if you go for a run, that's obviously going to hurt more. Whereas, on the other, uh, on the other side, um, inflammatory arthropathies uh, are more painful with inactivity, and then as you sort of loosen up a little bit, as you do a bit more exercise, they typically, typically get better. So if you do have someone with joint stiffness, these are really important things to ask about in differentiating uh, what the etiology is. So cardio history, again, paid cops fatigue. Uh, this is something I assume you've already learned. I'm pretty sure it was in the workbook. Um, again, as I stated before, compliance is really important. Uh, other things to ask about are just previous procedures, you know, stents, uh, coronary artery, bypass surgery, pacemakers, and then all the relevant risk factors, which I've listed there too. Um, sorry, I'm just like skipping some of the less important slides to the ones that I want to sort of explain a little bit more. Uh, so in terms of the cardio history and the systems view, uh, it's really uh, essential that you sort of, you know what the questions are firstly, but then you need to understand what they mean. So um, I've sort of broken it up into, you know, the different questions and things that they suggest. So in terms of left heart failure, where's my mouse gone? Here we go. So because the heart's not working here, all the fluid's going to back up into the lungs. So that's when you get your dyspneic type symptoms, so dyspnea, orthopnea, PND. Whereas with the right heart, if that fails, that's going to go back into your systemic circulation. So that's when you experience things like ankle swelling and uh, a few other things as well. Um, other findings, chest pain, look, chest, can, chest pain can be anything, let's be honest. But um, in this setting, it suggests like ischemia, infarction, uh, palpitations or arrhythmias. Intermittent claudication, um, I'm not sure how well you guys understand this one at this point. It's like personally, it wasn't something that I, I really experienced until third year. Um, but just to give you a brief overview of it, it suggests peripheral arterial disease um, and due to atherosclerosis. So uh, the way you'd ask about intermittent claudication is like, do you ever get calf pain that comes on after walking a particular distance? And that's really pathognomonic of intermittent claudication because it means it, it's essentially angina in your legs. Um, like, on, honestly, it's ischemic pain. Um, so you'll walk, say, 500 metres, and then the pain comes. You rest a little bit, and then the pain goes away. In terms of syncope, that can just be caused by many things, cardiac causes, for example. And then fatigue, again, is very nonspecific. So I tried to come up with a little bit of a, re a, little bit of a mnemonic for the RESP history. It doesn't entirely make sense. It's meant to be like chess, chess without the E, and then other random stuff. Except <laughs> stridor is more of an upper respiratory thing. So, look, it may help. It most likely won't. <laughs> uh, another way to approach the rest history, which I find a little bit more helpful now, is to just go down the pipe. So, you know, you start at the nose. What can go wrong, wrong at the nose? It's running. You're sneezing. You've got nosebleeds. Okay, work down a little bit. Um, do you have any noises when you breathe? Perhaps, like, with inspiration, a stridor, a wheeze go down a little bit further, are you coughing? Can you like characterize it? Is there any sputum? Is there any blood? Uh, if there is sputum, you want to ask more about that, like color, smell, quantity, etc. Shortness of breath, uh, how, much, uh, how much activity does it take to become short of breath? Uh, chest pain, sort of characterize whether it's pleuritic or not. And then other things as well. Um, in terms of night sweats, you want to you also want to see if they actually are night sweats. Because what sort of suggests night sweats is that, you know, you'll be waking up in the middle of the night and you'd be having to change your pyjamas or change your bed sheets. Like, it's really severe. Uh, not just sweating a little bit when you go to bed. Other important questions to ask about? Um, okay. And it's, it's very similar for the gastrointestinal uh, systems review as well. So literally just uh, the way I find helpful is just to go down the pipe and think about sort of what can go wrong at each level. Um, in terms of abdo pain, you also want to characterize that more with WWQQ. Okay. Uh, 
Um, yeah, Koshi speaks wisdom. Um, when, you, when a station doesn't go to plan, um, and there's always one that you don't like as much, uh, don't let that affect your, fit, your further stations, because um, that, you know, that could stuff up the whole OSCE if you let the one station mess all the other ones up. So if one doesn't go to plan, and let's be honest, like the odds are that that may happen. Um, don't let it worry you, just forget about it, leave it in the past, and just move on and have a fresh start for the next station. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through all this. I just want to um, break up the Neurosystems Review into two potential ways of approaching it. So you can break it up into categories, so camps down here. Um, and then under each category, you have the different questions for that. Or you can just go the straight mnemonic. Um, it's quite a long one, though, and it's quite easy to forget what, you, <laughs> what each of the letters mean. So, uh, you know, whichever one suits you best. Exactly the same for the genera to urinary. Um, Many of these slides at the moment are here just for you guys to go back and, and sort of compare with your own notes. I think the, way in, the main thing that I'd highlight here is that in terms of the lower urinary tract symptoms, um, it's really helpful at this point to sort of categorize them into, where my mouse go, obstructive <coughs> and storage symptoms. Because um, uh, then, you know, obstructive are things when, of course, it's obstructing and you're not getting that urine out. Storage is more things like uh, incontinence and urgency. Um, and they have you know, quite different ideologies. Uh, the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory. Same for repro, um, you know, blues, male, reds, female. Diabetes, uh, this is actually quite, a, quite an important history. Um, I think it's one that's quite different to other histories you t you'll take. It's not so much a WWQQ type history, but uh, you've got to be aware of like the whole patient and sort of how they're coping, what their compliance has been like. And it's quite important to ask about the complications of diabetes. So breaking that up into macrovascular and microvascular, um, and then see if they've had any infections and the psychological impacts of that as well. Um, it's also important to ask about previous hospital admissions with, say, like DKA or anything like that. So instead of focusing so much on the various systems reviews themselves, I thought it'd be more it'd be more beneficial to you guys to actually talk about you know ways to approach histories and ways you know you've got your two minutes at the start of an OSCE and you're just sitting there with a piece of paper like how do you approach each presenting complaint? Use your two minutes wisely. Um, you may it'll help you sort of remember differentials and stuff. Okay, so firstly, we'll start off with the anatomical approach. So this one's really, history, uh, really useful when you're taking things like a pain history, because uh, that's quite a localized symptom. Um, so WWQQ is great for that. And if you're given in the stem the location of the pain, you can use that to sort of start thinking of differentials. So we use chest pain, for example. What can cause, like what organs can cause uh, pain in the chest? So we're thinking things like heart, lungs, pericardium, pleura, esophagus. Um, skin slash neuro is like kind of shingles type presentation. Um, and then the ribs as well. So then once you've got those categories or those organs, you can break that up into different like differentials for each of them. So heart's got quite a few. Uh, aorta, like aortic dissection, and a list of other ones then as well. And from there, like you don't have to write this all down. You can just sort of think of it in your mind. Um, then you can break it up into the ones that are more important and the ones that you want to ask about. So I if I were given a stem about chest pain, things that I'd be asking about or is like, is that chest pain crushing? Because that would suggest like an ischemic uh, cardiac type pain. And then, you know, does it radiate to the left arm and jaw? And then you can break that up further into does it come with exertion and does it relieve with rest? Or is it quite unpredictable and is it more severe, which would suggest more um, an acute coronary syndrome, like uh, uh, unstable angina or a... <laughs> um, <laughs> you never want to be that guy, do you? <laughs> Uh, which is a bit more unpredictable and severe. Um, other really important questions to ask, uh, is it like a tearing type pain and does it radiate to the back? Because that would suggest an aortic dissection which you'd want to exclude. Um, pericardial or pleuritic pain is a bit more of a stabbing type pain. So you've got pericarditis or perhaps um, 
severe lung pathology as well. So, you know, is it localised to one side? Is it worse when you breathe? And also, does it have other symptoms that suggest various uh, lung etiologies? So, for PE, does it have sudden onset pneumonia? Do you have like a cough and a fever with that? Uh, pneumothorax, like you need um, a bit more sort of uh, examination as well. You know, are they perhaps a tall basketballer? That could help. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, it, uh, esophageal pain from, like, say, gourd is a bit more sort of retrosternal, uh, like, burning-type pain. And then when you're lying down, it gets worse, you know, because, like, gravity. Um, so here's another one. Um, so if you just use 30 seconds to uh, write down just a couple differentials um, for this case. <coughs> So, yeah, we, we, we've already covered them in the previous slides, so which hopefully it shouldn't take too long. So, in terms of systems of use, things that you'd want to be asking about or if, are, of, um, of course, if there's chest pain, you really want to exclude cardiac stuff. So, you'd want to be asking the full cardiac history. Uh, respiratory would probably be a second one. So, asking about like, is the pain is the pain pleuritic? Do you have cough? Do you have fever? Is there any sputum? Uh, GIT is like, is it worse after meals? Does it like that burning pain? And then you can ask about, ask about um, I guess, like less severe stuff. So perhaps like shingles, or is there any, any like rib fractures or costochondritis and things like that. So then we get to the systems-based approach. So this is one that you prob you're probably using at the moment, and it's just thinking of the most relevant system uh, according to the presenting complaint. Um, but then sometimes you can get a little bit stuck and not, you, you know, you're getting a lot of no's in your history and you're not sure where to go from there. So a, a nice way to sort of think through it at this point is go just from head to toe and think, uh, ask a few questions from each system uh, in order like that. So, you know, head starting with neuro, then ask perhaps like psych, thyroid slash endocrine, cardio, resp, GIT, uh, genital urinary, MSK room and the systemic ones as well. Um, and at least that way, like, I, I'm not saying ask all of these questions in an OSCE because there's nowhere near enough time for that. Uh, but if you want to just do a quick screen and help it in, like, help your own thinking, then that's a nice way to sort of think about it. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll do another one of these exercises. This one does get coffee. Um, so just write a quick list of differentials um, for fatigue. Yeah, that's, that's probably enough time. Um, so I, I don't want to give you too long because I'm sure you guys want to get out of here. <laughs> so it, using that method of going through the dis different systems head to toe, uh, these are potential differentials that you can come up with and, and may want to ask about. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this is the order you'd ask about, but just a, a way of thinking about it. So then, after you've sort of thought that way, you can sort of break it down into what's more important, you believe. So things I'd sort of suggest would be maybe like uh, a psychological thing, like depression, uh, any thyroid disorders, chronic heart failure, 
obstructive sleep apnea, um, anemia, cancer, and any idiopathic stuff going on there. So, I'd uh, like to, oh, whoops. <laughs> you can, someone can get a coffee later. Um, this is kind of buzzwordy, but hey, that's right. <laughs> what, what, what systems would you ask? What, what, would, you, what would be your main systems? <laughs> Good, what else? Heim, yeah. Any others? We've got Resp and Heim. GI, GI, cool. Um, yeah, they're all good ones, I think. Uh, endocrine is probably a good one as well. Just thinking thyrotoxicosis, perhaps. Um, and then, yeah, you can read over that again. So then, and lastly, lastly then there's also the etiology-based approach. So, again, this is helpful um, if you're not really sure where to go and you're just thinking, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of diseases could be causing this symptom? So... Uh, so there's a nice little mnemonic you can use there, and it's just vitamin C. And using that, uh, you can approach many different things. So if you were thinking in terms of like, conscious, like a reduced conscious state, uh, what could be causing that? So you know, what vascular cause could be? Could there be a stroke? Infection, inflammatory, could there be like meningitis, encephalitis? Trauma, mechanical, thinking like uh, head trauma, epidural hematomas. Autoimmune, any like autoimmune encephalitis going on. Um, metabolic and endocrine, there are so many things that can cause that, like electrolyte uh, abnormalities, um, uh, hyper, like severe hyperglycemia, anything like that. Um, iatrogenic, have, you know, have the doctors given a new drug or anything like that that can cause altered uh, conscious state. Neoplastic, could there be a tumour? Um, so it's a nice way to just screen through different causes for a differential. Um, okay, you can get a, someone can get a coffee for this one. Uh, what are three potential differentials for an acute diarrhea? You got to come up here and say it though. This one's a gift, guys. Come on. Yeah, Calvin's got it. Well, like acute or sort of subacute, you could go as well. Yeah. Or drugs or drugs okay. um, so, could have taken magnesium or um, could have hyperthyroid and or could have gastro. Yeah, cool. Good on yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I told you. Um, yeah, so look, acute would be more of an infective type picture. So think gastroenteritis, inflammatory bowel syndrome. Um, oh, sorry, ir irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, autoimmune could be like inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease. Hyperthyroidism could be a bit more of a subacute picture, maybe even chronic. And then medications as well can cause that. So, nicely done. All right, so do you guys want to just like, would you want to stand up and stretch quickly or do you want to just keep powering through it? Power through it, cool. Um, so just a few little tips for exams. Wash your hands is just so, so important. Like, no matter what exam you do, there will always be a mark for washing your hands. So just get in the habit of, um, while, you're taking, while you're doing consent, introducing yourself, all that, just practice giving them a good wash. On practice, you can never practice enough for OSCEs. Just keep going and going and going until you can do stuff in your sleep. Because, um, you know, on the day, it's, it, it can be a little bit stressful. Um, you know, the nerves can start getting to you. And the more you've done something, the more it's just sort of muscle memory. Um, and then it just becomes second nature. So it, that really helps. I can't stress this enough. It's really important to follow instructions as well. Um, so with that, because um, often if you get an exam, it'll say uh, perform a, a central cardiac examination or perform, uh, like only examine the abdomen perhaps for a GI exam. So with that, um, by following instructions, it's partly for your own benefit because it means you get more time to do the things that they've allocated for you to do. And also there won't be, there won't be marks for the unnecessary stuff that wastes time. And also it shows that you know what you're doing. Um, because, you know, if you go into an exam and you're not as confident with it, you'll just sort of go through the whole exam as you've learnt it, starting general appearance, going to hands, doing everything. Um, 
and that sort of shows the examiner that you don't know it as well and that you don't know how to adapt, um, which is a really important part of being a doctor because doctors don't go and do a full cardio exam, then a full rest exam, then a full gastro exam. Um, so it, it gives the examiner a much better impression of how well you know the exams. Um, also, when you get the prompt, it's handy to just write down on a piece of paper what you do need to do, what you don't need to do. Um, and if you're unsure about something, it's safer to do it, and then they'll most likely tell you not to do it. When you go into an exam, just be friendly, please. <laughs> um, like, it actually makes such a difference, because if you go in, like, all really cold, um, you know, the examiner won't get a good impression, and the patient won't get a good, like, the actor, sim patient won't get a good impression. Um, and then, you know, it's, look, it's not sort of, they are meant to be objective clinical examinations, but um, often, I don't know about often, but I, I've heard, um, if there's sort of a mark on the line, because examiners are human as well, um, they might just be a little bit more likely to give you the mark if they think that you know what you're doing or, uh, you know, or if you've been really friendly to them or something. I know that's not, I know it, it, that's not the way <laughs> it, it should work, but everyone's human, so rather just use that to your advantage. Um, and then also the patient will be more likely to be cooperative if you're really friendly to them as well. This is, this goes along the same lines. Just be, like, walk in and be confident with what you're doing. Um, be confident in your abilities. You know, you guys have been learning this for two years. You know how to do it. You can do it. Um, so <laughs> believe in yourself. Um, and again, like they may be more likely to just push you over, push you over the edge to a mark if you're a little, if it's a little bit iffy. Um, speak clearly. So you know, if you go into an exam and you say, you know, I can't see any clubbing on the fingers. I can't see any tendons and I can't see any general lesions. I'll blow it. Like, the examiner's not going to hear you, and they can't give you marks if they don't see you doing it, and they don't hear you doing it. So make sure it's really clear, like, okay, I'm looking for clubbing. I'm maybe not that slow, but you know what I mean. Uh, also, look, this won't really get you marks, but I guess it's just a little, a little thing I have. Um, please, if they give you the patient's name, as best as you can, please use it. Um, like, nobody wants to be the anonymous patient where you're saying, oh, the patient doesn't have tendons down to Marta. The patient has jaundiced eyes. <coughs> um, no one wants to be that anonymous patient. So if they have a name, just say, okay, Steve. Steve doesn't have any whatever. Um, and, like, it may not help as much in OSCEs, but it'll, it'll certainly help next year. Um, also, get to the money. So... You know, in terms of many of your exams, cardio, rest, gastro, <coughs> the money is where the bulk of the exam is. So either in the, like listening to the heart, like the abdomen, the lungs. So it, it is important to go through the peripheries and look for all those little peripheral signs. But you want to be as slick as you can through that because the money and where all the marks are is the central part of the exam. Also, OSCEs are like the theatre of medicine. I don't know if any of you guys got around drama and stuff at school, um, but that's to your advantage because you, you've really got to play things up. Um, so it's like uh, it's like taking a driver's license. You know, when you if they want you to do head checks and check in your mirror, you know, you, you'd usually just sort of wince over to the side. But when you're driving in the license test, you sort of over the shoulder, <laughs> over the shoulder. Like you're really trying to play it up a little bit. And then use your eyes. Like, don't say, oh, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. You have a person in front of you, even though they're an actor, again, they're still a human. So just say what you see. Uh, you know, if they have a scar on their arm that may be relevant, say, there's a scar here. There's a rash here. The, um, like, it, it may be kind of awkward, but you can comment on the patient's body habitus because... It, it's medical practice. Um, I've got something. I've got. I've got something on that in a second. So don't go straight to that. And also, <laughs> also vitals. Vitals are really important as well. Um, so in in every examination, you should be in the habit of uh, going in, introducing yourself, getting consent. You know, washing your hands, doing a general appearance, and then the first thing after that should be, okay, I would like to take vitals now. Um, 
when you're practicing, actually practice doing it. Because um, it, it's a really good skill to have and vitals are important in pretty much every examination. Because the main thing that they do is they tell, they tell you, okay, is this patient sick? Is this patient not sick? Uh, how urgently do we have to deal with them? Um, and then the further clinical signs <coughs> can say, you know, why are they sick? Okay, so in terms of individual examinations, um, again, just a little disclaimer, these are just handy hints, not the full examinations themselves. Uh, general inspection, go in, state, again, what do you see in front of you? What does the patient look like? Uh, in terms of body habitus, which I said before, please don't go in and the first thing you say is like, oh, this patient has an increased body habitus. <laughs> No one, no, no one wants to be that patient. So start with simple things. Are they well? Are they unwell? Do they appear alert and oriented? Are they in any, are they in any pain at all? And then you can get to slightly more specific things after that. In terms of the upper limb neuro exam, um, when you're assessing tone, you want to be assessing like individual joints. So start at the wrist, then like start at the wrist by holding each side of the wrist, then go to the elbow by holding each side of the elbow and not sort of doing multiple joints at once. Um, arm drift is something that confuses quite a few people. So uh, from, from t in Talia and O'Connor, what it says is uh, upper motor neuron uh, lesions tend, tend to go down, cerebellar tends to go up, and searching is a bit more like uh, proprioception. Um, in terms of power, I guess the most important thing I could say is just give really straight and simple instructions. So if I get, um, can I get one of you guys to come up quickly? Cheers. Okay, so if you were doing a, um, an upper limb neuro exam for power, you'd want to give really just uh, simple, easy to understand instructions and get them to copy. So, okay. Can you put your arms up like a chicken wing? Now don't let me push down. Keep your arms there. Now push down against my arms. Good. Elbows to your side, fists up. Don't let me pull them down. Good. Now push down against my hands. Good. Arms out, fists back. Don't let me pull them down. Good. Fists down, don't let me pull them up. Great. Fingers out, don't let me push them down. Good. Fingers down, don't let me pull them out. Great. And now for abduction and adduction. Um, if you put your hands out, sorry, I don't really know. Come on, thanks for helping me out with this. If you put your hand up, uh, many people will do it, <laughs> face the crowd, many people will do it like this and just try, try and resist my movement as best you can. And it's just really easy to squeeze it like that. So you don't really good, get a good assessment of abduction and adduction, where a better way to do it is if you use your index fingers and you can just press like that and that gives you a much better impression of what their um, finger AB duction and AD duction is like. So, in terms of power, uh, <laughs> this is another little coffee thing up for grabs. Um, does anyone want to come up here and say what each of the power ratings indicate? Surely someone's going. <laughs> Dongju, I can see you doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong. Just Give it an honest crack. Right, Tiff. She's got it. So zero is like there is no muscle contraction at all. Yep. One is you can see the contraction, but there is no movement. Yep. Um, and then two is you can only move it without gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, three is you can move it. Oh, I don't remember. Three is like, you can move it against gravity, but it's weak. Yeah. And then four is you can move it against resistance, but it's a bit weaker. Mm -hmm. And then five is like, you can move it. Spot on. Congrats. So, exactly. So, zero is paralysis. One's just like a flicker of movement. <laughs> Two is movement without gravity, so like along a bed or something. Um, three, movement ag against gravity. Four, weakened. Five, normal power. So in terms of reflexes, just be as slick as possible going through them. Uh, know your myotomes for each of them as well. Uh, and then sensation, you can just do a quick screen first by just <coughs> running the back of your hand down a patient's arm. Um, like if you use the, the front of your hand, it's kind of weird, so use the back. Um, and then just say, <laughs> and then just say like, you know, is there anywhere that feels abnormal? Uh, in terms of a quick screen for peripheral nerves, um, 
This is also really useful in the hand exam, but uh, quick things you can do to check motors, like point a gun, A-OK, -okay, make a star, done. Lower limb neuros, essentially the same principles. Just remember gait and the tests that come with that, and also clonus as well. Um, ooh, also, in terms of tone for the lower limb neuro exam, uh, do you want to get someone else up again? Or you can go up again as well if you want. Uh, this one may be a bit harder to see, if you just wouldn't mind lying on the ground. <laughs> so a, a really simple way to assess tone is just if you put your legs out straight, please, and just let your leg go nice and floppy, and then just pick it up and drop, just like that. Hold well on, thanks. <laughs> um, and then if there's hypertonia, it, it won't go down as quickly. <laughs> Myotomes, uh, lower limb ones are quite hard to remember. I've attached a little rhyme thing you can use. I think there's only one I do need to explain, is that for hip extension, for Superman flu, that means like that. So <laughs> Superman's flying. So bring your leg out, leg out the back. Um, don't disregard the strains examinations. Um, so, you know, things like thyroid, heme, renal, all that stuff. Cranial nerves, this isn't the whole examination, just a few little pointers for different nerves. So, um, you know, cranial nerve one, you can't really test it that much unless they give you something to test it with. So you can even just ask about the smell or say, you know, can you smell the alcohol hand wash on my hand or something like that. Um, Snellen chart, remember you're doing it with glasses on. You're testing their optic nerve, not their eyes themselves. And remember to use the ophthalmoscope. Um, when you're doing the H test for ophthalmoplegia, um, uh, you know, you're asking if they can see, if there's any diplopia and stuff, but uh, when you're going around to this, when you're going laterally, uh, just hold it there for a few seconds, because <coughs> that'll sort of try and get in, uh, help you identify any nystagmus, if there is any, and then you can sort of go up and down, and then go side, hold it there for a few seconds, and then keep going. Uh, in terms of the facial nerve, um, one important thing is that uh, if it's in, in, uh, in terms of like the frontalis muscle, if there's an upper motor neuron lesion, it's forehead sparing, meaning they're like par uh, paralyzed on one side except the forehead. And if there's a lower motor neuron lesion, there's forehead paralysis. Um, in terms of the whisper test, uh, one thing I found is it's good to avoid using letters and numbers that rhyme. Because if you say, oh, okay, so if you whisper like three, and ask them to repeat it back to you. They could say like T or B or E or V. And it gets really confusing. So good ones to use, you like W, Z, <coughs> 4, stuff like that. Um, cranial nerves 9 and 10. Uh, the uvula is drawn away from the pathological side. And with 12, the tongue moves towards the pathological side. Um, cool. In terms of cardio, this question's a little bit harder. But do you guys know? Which one's which? Someone want to yell it out? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yep, so Oslo's nerves are painful. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So here's a, a little table of what they are and also why they're caused. However, just remember that these things are incredibly rare. So it's really not worth spending that much time looking for them. Um, it's handy to know the etiology of them as well. Um, but if you just said, look, I can't see any peripheral stigmata of infective endocarditis, and name them if you want, um, or show that you're looking for them, that should be good enough. Oh. Uh, in terms of looking for peripheral perfusion, another really good thing to do is just compare the color of the patient's hands to your own hands. Because you know that you, you most likely will have good peripheral perfusion. Um, so then if it looks drastically different, you know something's wrong. Vitals, again, I can't stress this enough. They're incredibly important. With rhythm, uh, one thing that I've learned sort of very early in sort of third year by getting grilled about it is that um, rhythm is either regular or irregular. You can't have slightly regular or moderately irregular. It's, it's binary. It's one or the other. Um, and then if it is irregular, you can sort of differentiate between regularly and irregularly. Uh, also other vitals as well. Um, Face, just warn the patient before you're going to start grabbing their eyes. No one wants to have anyone reaching out at them, so just give a bit of warning. JVP, um, this is something that 
I'd imagine many of you and many other people everywhere don't know how to do. Um, so remember, you're lying the patient at 45 degrees, and you're looking along sternocleidomastoid from the clavicle to the earlobe. Um, odds are, in most of you, you won't see it because it's not raised. So what you can do, if you do want to see it on yourselves, is instead of being at 45 degrees, you can just lower the angle a little bit, um, even lying flat, and then there's a better chance you might see it there. Otherwise, you can... If you don't see it, you should say you don't see it. I reckon, as long as you show you know where you're looking for it, um, you probably could save it. And say, like, I'd expect to see it along here. I can't see it. If I were to examine it more, I may want to lower the bed. Um, so then... This is just where you look for it again, and it's got that specific waveform. Don't worry about that too much. Just know it's got sort of two peaks. So just a reminder of the JVP character. It's, uh, you can see it, but it's not palpable uh, like an artery would be, uh, and it's more prominent going inward and flickers twice. Uh, so carotids, just remember one side at a time. Don't make the patient collapse. And comment on volume and character. Um, Precordium, it's all there, you've done it before. And then when you're listening to the heart, actually listen to it. Like listen to heart sound one, heart sound two, and say what you can hear. Um, and then you can do the different manoeuvres to ex like exaggerate each of the sounds. Uh, also another thing you can do in the cardio exam is listen to the lung bases. Uh, like it, it doesn't take long, and if, it, if you do have time for it, it shows that you know what you're doing, because uh, it means that you're looking for signs of left heart failure. Um, also, and it's really easy to do this while the patient's leaning forward uh, when you're palpating for sacral edema anyway. So it doesn't take much time, but it, it makes a bit of a difference. Um, and then fitting edema as well. Now the peripheral vascular exam. I heard you guys have had a bit of a rough time with this one. Um, like, uh, I mean, it's pretty unlikely that you'd get it again, but I thought I'd just quickly break it down for you, um, just if you ever need to approach it any time in the near future. So... Uh, a way to approach it would be arterial insufficiency and venous insufficiency. So uh, with arterial insufficiency, you're just not getting enough blood to the peripheries uh, due to things like atherosclerosis. Whereas with venous insufficiency, the veins aren't draining the limb well uh, due to like faulty valves, uh, potentially like DVTs a bit more acutely and things like that. So um, with arterial in general, you're looking for signs of not much blood. Whereas with venous, in general, you're looking for signs of too much blood. So then it's nice little mnemonics to remember them. Uh, when you're inspecting for it, and this can be helpful in your diabetes examination as well, uh, there's the um, mnemonic SAD values. You can just go through that. Um, also, I must credit another third year student, Han Go, who's very proud to have come up with that mnemonic. Um, other things you can assess for... Uh, in terms of palpating arteries, if you can palpate either one of dorsalis, dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial, uh, that means perfusion's okay due to all the anastomoses and stuff. Um, if not, then you can sort of work up the leg. Sad values is a life changer. Thank you. Um, resp exam, I don't need to go into this too much. You guys know how to do it. Um, uh, it's important to revise the auscultation findings out of Talion O'Connor. Just um, uh, revise sort of what each of the, the sounds actually means and why it's caused. Um, and also just write down the things like you forget. Like I always forget asterixis and HPOA. Um, actually, on that as well, rather say like hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. osteoarthropathy. Like I, I know it's a mouthful to say, but they do expect you to actually understand what the... Um, what HPOA means. Abdo exam, same as before, get to the money. Uh, when you're palpating the abdomen, look at the patient's face. Um, look at Steve's face. Because um, then that's how you're assessing if they're, any, if they're in any pain. Like they may say they're not in pain, but if they're wincing, then that suggests otherwise. Um, also a nice little smooth thing you can do is when you're palpating for the spleen, you've got them sort of rolled onto their side you can sort of place your hand around the back and get them to roll back onto your hand, and then you can blow up the kidneys from there, meaning it's just one less movement for the patient to do. <laughs> thyroid exam, uh, you want to practice it half, uh, you, you want to practice the full thyroid exam, say if someone has a goiter, 
Uh, but you also want to do a focus, you want to practice a focused hypothyroid and a focused hyperthyroid. Um, like it, it's not uncommon to only do uh, one or the other. So it, it's a really good habit to get into. Um, uh, also know the specific signs for Graves' disease. Uh, ophthalmopathy uh, is like exophthalmos is like the most common one. The other ones are pretty rare, but you got to look for them. Look for them anyway to get the marks. Um, eye examination. This is just here for your reference. Ear and throat again for your reference. Um, one thing when you're inspecting uh, the mouth and throat exam is it's helpful to do it in like circles if you want to call it that. So you know you can start around this circle here at the lips. Then go to the next circle around the teeth and gums. Then maybe like another circle around here. And then circle around the uvula, top palate, <coughs> circle around the tonsils, etc. And just sort of move uh, posteriorly like that. MSC, I know you guys have covered this in your psych lecture. Um, I just wanted to add in a little mnemonic that I found helpful. Um, I actually have a friend, Sam, who loves apples, so it's really handy for me, but uh, it may work for you as well. MMSE, um, like you guys would absolutely be loving it if you got this for an OSCE because um, <laughs> they like give you the sheet. It's right there for you. I guess important things to sort of uh, separate yourselves from the crowd are sort of any proper introduction, consent, wash your hands, same as any exam. Um, and then just sort of uh, preempting it well. So you may want to say like, okay, I'm just going to ask you a few questions uh, now to just test your memory. Uh, like, it may seem a little bit silly, but it's good to just get a baseline now so that if anything happens, we can compare your results then to your results now. So it doesn't make the patient feel like they're stupid and you think, like, they don't remember anything. Um, remember that each of the questions is timed, so keep an eye on your watch. Some are, like, 30 seconds, uh, like, uh, around there. Um, and familiarise yourself with the scoring methods as well. Uh, in particular, spell world backwards. If they swap two letters and everything else is all right, that's only counted as one mistake. Um, so just be aware of that. And yeah, so crucial skills to well now to learn well now. Um, uh, like I was I was talking to our prof today, and she's saying these are the stuff that you should absolutely be able to know coming into third year, and it'll set you ahead. So you know you can do it while you're practicing for these OSCEs. It's so simple to do. But just like know what a normal radial pulse feels like, what a normal carotid pulse feels like, what normal heart sounds feel like, what normal lung sounds feel like. It's like you're doing it anyway, so you may as well do it properly. Um, again, revise the weird and obscure stuff. Like it does come up. Okay, so now we'll get on to some investigations. Um, so there's, uh, I've tried to put together a bit of like a basic approach to examine it, two investigations because, um, you know, all, you know, as different as they are, ECGs, chest x-rays, <coughs> LFTs, other types of bloods, um, and you've done ECGs already today. Um, there's a, a general approach that you can use uh, to all of them. And by learning that, it means no matter what the investigation in almost every circumstance, uh, you have a format and a template to fall back on. So... Um, so firstly, you want to, uh, you know, and, and again, it depends on the circumstance. Like if you're presenting to an examiner or presenting to a patient, uh, there's, there's very different ways on, of doing that. But in general, uh, approaching the investigation itself, you want to focus on, like, check the patient's identity. Is it the right patient you've got there? So name, age, gender, you are number. You generally need about three of those. Um, check the date of the investigation. Like, it's no good looking at somebody's ECG if it was the one that was done last year. Uh, that doesn't help you very much at all. Um, and also, you may get information about why the investigation was performed in the first place. So if you're, what's an example? Um, if you're looking for a chest, ex look, looking at a chest x-ray, right? <coughs> and in the prompt it says, okay, this person has dyspnea and they have a fever and a productive cough that will sort of guide the things that you're looking for and the differentials that you make. And it really helps you, so do pay attention to those things. Um, ask, ask or check if there have been any previous uh, investigations. Like if somebody had a right bundle branch block five years ago and they still have it now, you know, whoop you do it doesn't really mean much. But if it's a new one, that'd be, that, that may be a bit more significant. Um, 
And also, this is exactly the same as examinations. Uh, but just simply, uh, the, the best way to do it is describe what you see and what you don't see. So if the haemoglobin's low, state that the hemo I see that the haemoglobin is low. Um, if it's, you know, there's no change in the white cells, say, okay, the white cells appear normal. By simply saying what you see, you can tick off many of the marks already, and then you can just get some more for synthesis and differentials and things like that. And then on the next point, synthesize your findings and uh, just make a comment or two. So ECG, you've already done, so I don't need to go into that. So chest x-ray. Um, uh, you guys have done a bit of that <laughs> this year. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard the sort of doctors A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H approach to that. Is that correct? <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so I'll quickly revise through that again. So <coughs> patient details, the same, thing that, the same things I mentioned before. So name, date of birth, date of, birth, uh, date of x-ray. Um, other specific things are just the type of x-ray. So is it PA, is it AP, is it a lateral view? And also, what position is the patient in? Um, just PAs, the one, like the stock standard one. Uh, AP may be, like AP may suggest that they're sort of may perhaps bed bound or they could be a little bit sicker. Um, RIP next uh, is just checking the quality of the x ray. Um, the most important one of those would probably be rotation. So just check that the spinous processes are halfway between the sternoclavicular joints. Then you move on to soft and hard, tis soft and hard tissues. Um, again, there isn't heaps in here. I guess things you would be looking for, like rib fractures, for example, uh, dislocations, any deformities, um, perhaps like a scoliosis or something as well. Um, uh, in the airway, you'd want to see if the trachea is central, deviated. Uh, check the angle of the carina. Like, you know, usually it'd say that, but if you add some enlarged lymph nodes underneath it, that sort of push it out a little bit. Um, check the borders. Uh, the way I interpret this is just the pleura and the, cl the costophrenic angles. So is there any pleural thickening and is there any blunting of the costophrenic angles? In terms of the heart, check its position. You know, is it on the left where it should be? Uh, what's the size? Now in terms of size, it's meant to be half the width of the thorax in the PA view. Uh, if it's in the AP view, you, you technically can't comment on the size of the heart. Uh, just because of the way that the x-ray sort of diverges and then uh, the heart sort of appears larger on an AP, um, on an AP film. Uh, but you may want to just say, like, it looks large, but officially I can't comment on it. Um, and then look if the borders of the heart are visible, like left and right. Uh, hemidiaphragms, are the hemidiaphragms actually visible? And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Uh, is right higher than the left? Is there sub, sub diaphragmatic air? which would suggest a bowel perforation of some sort, or, or, or any other reason for air to be in the abdomen. Uh, extras, ECG dots, etc. Um, you know, if you can see that somebody's intubated, it means they're sick. So uh, that's, that's, for example, one to comment on. Uh, vascularity of the lung fields. Uh, you're just looking at the pulmonary vessels, um, see how engorged they are. Is there a pneumothorax? Hopefully you should identify that one. And any abnormal <coughs> opacities. Uh, gastric bubble, not that important, and hyla, there's not really much there. So again, just here's a normal one with some anatomical landmarks. Uh, you may want to just go, go through that in your own time and just practice going through the system. So in terms of a few principles of x-rays, um, you might have covered this a little bit, but it's, uh, it's really useful to go through it again. So uh, x-rays uh, x-rays measure density. <coughs> and also particularly differences in density. So, you know, if something lets all the x-rays go through, it'll be black or radiolucent. And if it sort of stops all the x-rays going through, uh, then it's white or radio-opaque. And there's that sort of scale going from air, fat, soft tissue, slash fluid, bone, metal. Now, when two, area, when two structures of similar density are next to each other, it means you can't see a clear border. So, for example, if you had a little bit of consolidation right up against the heart, you wouldn't be able to see that heart border, um, which would suggest that it is consolidation and you can sort of uh, suggest where it is. Uh, same for the hemidiaphragms as well. And if you do see something, again, this comes back to the basic principle 
of describing what it is that's in front of your eyes. You don't have to say what you think the diagnosis is straight away. You just say what you can actually see. <clears throat> so a few simple principles. If there's alveolar fluid, it's generally like fluffy in nature or looks like a cloud. If it's interstitial, uh, which is things more like an APO, for example, it's described more to be like dots and dashes. And then if there's any like pleural fluids, uh, you'll see the meniscus sign, uh, which is just that kind of U shape. <clears throat> so does somebody want to just quickly come up and uh, <coughs> describe this x-ray for us? This one's coffee. Uh, so you guys are getting a bit drowsy, so you may want a coffee afterwards. I do know a few of your names, so I can. No one? Three. Not saying. <coughs> Going, right, going. Um, okay, so this one, look, it's a little bit iffy. Um, there's a chance the tra the is potentially like a little bit displaced to the right. The heart's, the mediastinum is displaced to the right, potentially a little bit. Uh, the main finding, though, is that large area of uh, radiolucency, uh, similar to air, um, in the left hemithorax. That's because it is air. Um, and then that soft little region here, that's actually the collapsed lung. So in terms of <coughs> what do you guys think this is? Someone yell it out. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax? Cool. Um, I heard someone say tension pneumothorax over there. Uh, this is actually the thing I was sort of less sure about because uh, tension can actually be a bit more of a clinical diagnosis. So like they start going into shock and things like that. So you'd need more sort of, like it's a very big pneumothorax, don't get me wrong, but you'd need a little bit more clinical information to sort of make that. What about this one? Okay. So I think you guys probably want to keep going, so I'll just brush through it. Um, <clears throat> so it's an AP mobile erect chest, chest x-ray, and there's that diffuse opacity throughout the lungs that... Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it looks a bit more like dot and dashy in nature. So because of that, you'd think it's a bit more interstitial. So you'd be thinking things... Also, the trachea looks pretty deviated as well. It could be rotated. Um, so you'd be thinking things like APO. And then lastly, uh, this one's a little bit more simple. Um, and that's just because you can see that meniscus sign in the right hemidiaphragm suggesting a pleural effusion there. <coughs> Peak flow meter... This is something you guys can probably just practice in your own time. I've sort of attached a, a, attached, um, a few little instructions for that. Um, importantly, I think, and this, this, this can potentially like, come up in questions as well, is that, um, or OSCE's questions, whatever, is that the value that you do use is the highest of the three numbers. It's not like the average or the middle one or something weird like that. Uh, you do it three times and you pick the highest one. <coughs> then compare it to the results on there and see, you know, it's normal, it's here. Spirometry, um, this is actually a really important diagram. Uh, this, comes, this comes up a lot in, you know, second year, third year, beyond. Um, so just, you know, capacities are sums of different volumes. So then if you can remember what the volumes are, it should help uh, knowing what the capacities are. So then, just to brush through uh, the different spirometry findings. So, uh, FEV1 is the amount, the amount of air that you exhale uh, with like a uh, forceful exhalation in the first second, and then FEC is just everything that you exhale. So, um, FEV, you should, you should technically get about 80% of your lung, like your air out, uh, in the first second, and then the 20 second, uh, the 20% sort of after that. Um, in obstructive defects. It's like blowing through a straw. So you've got all the air in there. You can get it all out, but it just takes a lot slower, which is why the, um, the ratio or the percentage is reduced. Uh, also, importantly, with asthma, um, this is diagnosed with 12% increase and 200 mil increase, both of them. And then restrictive uh, is... They're both decreased, but the ratio is still, still there. Thanks, George. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. So, in terms of FEs, so there's just a few bloods and not too much longer, so I'll, I'll let you guys get home soon. Um, 
in terms of approaching full blood examinations, um, for the red blood cells, you want to start first with hemoglobin. Think, you know, is it too low? Is it too high? Uh, in your case, if it's going to be anything, it's going to be low. So then you want to think about, okay, why is it low? Why is this patient anemic? Then you want to look at things like the MC, uh, MCV and the MCH, and then think, okay, so MCV, is it normocytic? Is it uh, microcytic? Is it macrocytic? And what are the differentials for each of them? And then MCH could help you think like, okay, is it hypochromic? And then the reticulocyte count, um, again, this is something that's mentioned every now and then. Is re reticulocyte count essentially, um, it tells you about how fast the factory is working. So how fast the um, bone marrow is split, spitting out new blood cells. So if, it's, if the patient's anemic and the reticulocyte count is quite low, that can suggest things like aplastic anemia uh, where you're not producing many blood cells. Whereas if it's really high, it means you're losing blood and you're trying to replace it as quickly as you can. So that would be things more like hemolysis and bleeding as well. Platelets, look, I wouldn't think you're likely to get this. Is it high or low? You may be able to think of a few differentials for that. Um, in terms of white cells, just start at the white cell count. Is it high? You know, could there be an infection here? Uh, is it low? Um, you know, is there other, other things going on? Again, less of a second year thing. Uh, actually, I'll quickly go. So, sorry, for red blood cells, uh, I've, got, I've attached some differentials for each of the type of, types of the anemia which, um, with some mnemonics. Uh, white cells, if there's uh, a neutrophilia, think a bit more of a bacteria. So like, these aren't the only things that can cause this, but you know, there's that saying, like if you hear hooves, think horses, not zebras. So go to the most common thing first. So neutrophils, think bacterial infection, or, like some other inflammation. Uh, lymphocytes, that can be raised or lowered in a um, viral infection. Eosinophils, like things like allergies, parasites, drugs. Again, just say what's on the page in front of you. I cannot stress that enough. Iron studies. You guys aren't all that. You guys aren't all that keen on coming up here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we we can do it another way. We'll just get everyone involved because you guys are half asleep. Um, okay. So I'll go through each of the ones. If you think it's high, put your arms up in the sky. Uh, if you think it's low, keep your arms down. And if you think it's unaffected, just like put your arms out, right? <laughs> so we'll start with serum iron. So in iron deficiency, do you think it's high or low? I think. Low. Yeah. <laughs> good start. Um, how about the ferritin? Low. Low, good. Uh, serum transferrin and total iron binding capacity? High. High, good. And transferrin saturation? Very good. Um, yeah, so in terms of those, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, one thing's, it, it's helpful to know what each of those different uh, parameters tells you about. So an, an analogy I heard in one of the revision lectures last year is that imagine iron's kind of just money, right? And then, so serum iron can be like the, the loose change that's just hanging around in your pocket. Like there's not much, th this isn't my analogy by the way, I can't take credit for it, but it's like the loose change hanging around in your, in your pocket, for example. Uh, whereas ferritin is like where the iron's stored. Um, so, you know, you store your money in the bank. So ferritin's like the bank, where you keep it safe and secure. Uh, serum transferrin is, um, you know, the thing that carries it around, transports the money. So that could be like your wallet. Uh, whereas total iron binding capacity uh, that's, it's essentially like how much the serum transferrin wants iron. So like how much your, how much your wallet wants money, um, <laughs> essentially. Which, you know, given we're all students, it's, it's up there. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, transferrin saturation as well, which is essentially just like how much money is actually in your wallet. Um, serum transferrin is more like how many wallets you have, which doesn't fit as well, but hey, whatever, we'll, we'll roll with it. Um, okay, so if we go to an anemia of chronic disease, we'll do the same thing. Uh, arms in the sky, arms low, arms out to the side. So we'll start with serum iron. Three, two, one, go. Down, good. Uh, ferritin, three, two, one. Ooh, a bit mixed. Um, yeah, so for ferritin, 
<laughs> yeah, so, so, so ferritins, uh, it's quoted as either being like the same or raised. Um, what about serum, transferrin, and TRBC? Three, two, one, go. Not sure. We've got a few ups, got a few downs. It's actually down. Um, and transferrin saturation, three, two, one. No one's really sure, but... Look, you all went down, so you're all correct anyway. <laughs> so, um, in terms of anemia of chronic disease, um, a way to think about it is that uh, essentially... Like, I don't know if this is absolutely correct, but it's a nice way to think about it, is that your body wants to stop any pathogens from getting iron, right? So it tries to store up as much as it can, and it only gives the body, uh, like, what it needs to sort of keep going and stores the rest of it. So if you can see here, serum iron goes down, whereas ferritin, the banks, or the storage for the iron, that increases. So it's like you don't want to get mugged, so you're putting all your money in the bank. Right? Um, serum transferrin uh, goes down. You're not carrying many wallets around, and there's not much. Your wallets don't really want money at this point because you don't want to get mugged. And transferrin saturation, there's not much money in your wallet. Uh, oh, OK, I just gave it to you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, iron overload, think, you know, you've got a lot, a lot of iron. Everything's up, uh, except because you've got so much of it, you don't, want, you don't really need to carry many wallets around because the few that you have are absolutely like packed with money. Um, so you don't really need that. And an acute phase response. Um, just one little thing to be aware of is that ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So this is like things such as CRP and ESR. So when you have uh, situations where there's inflammation, ferritin will generally increase. <coughs> So in terms of LFTs now, I thought I'd just uh, put this here to um, uh, help you guys just quickly revise it again. Um, so if you remember, you know, red cells after about 120 days are broken down in these cup for cells in the spleen, liver, and bone marrow, um, essentially just macrophages. Um, the heme gets rid of its iron, and it's sort of converted to biliverdin, and then unconjugated bilirubin, which is transported uh, with albumin to the liver. Um, the liver conjugates it, becomes conjugated bil bilirubin, excreted as bile, and then a few other things as well. Um, so in terms of your LFTs, uh, you can break it up into three, maybe four sections. So first of all, you're talking about uh, the total bilirubin. So, you know, essentially, is the patient jaundiced? Are they not jaundiced? Um, and then you can start to think about why this may be the case. Uh, just one little side note. Um, is that jaundice typically, jaundice typically occurs uh, when bilirubin's getting around 50. That's when you start seeing it. Um, then you get the markers of liver dysfunction. So uh, AST and ALT, they reflect uh, hepatocellular damage, and ALP and GGT reflect biliary obstruction. Now, the reason, uh, the reason for each of these is that... Um, so AST and ALT, they're within, like, the cytosol of the hepatocytes, so when these uh, die um, due to like necrosis and stuff, uh, because you know the, the membrane's no longer intact, it releases it into the blood. Whereas with ALP, so these like raise really quickly. Whereas ALP and GGT, they're produced in the linings of in the lining of the bili biliary tree, so that um, you know when there's uh, a cholestatic cholestasis there, um, they'll just keep on producing this at a constant rate. But because it's not being drained out, it'll sort of increase over a period of a few days. And then, so AST, ALT are hepatitic, ALP, GGT are cholestatic, and then you can get mixed pictures as well. Lastly, in the LFTs, there's also um, markers of synthetic function of the liver, because the liver's responsible for producing a lot of proteins as well. So albumin, for example, various clotting factors too. So this can help reflect uh, if the liver's actually working or not. Um, just a few little side notes. ALP is also uh, released when there's like increased bone, turbo, bone turnover, so things like fractures, um, uh, you know, uh, bony metastases, things like that. Um, GGT is raised in isolation when you've had a lot of alcohol, and then also with alcohol, AST to ALT ratio is two to one. <coughs> so I've attached a little table here. Um, uh, so if you are presented with a jaundiced patient, 
um, you can use this to try and differentiate. Is it pre-hepatic? Is it hepatic? Is it post-hepatic? And then after that, you can uh, think about different different differentials for each of those subcategories. Um, really useful to use the urinum stool to um, differentiate these. I don't want to, again, you guys are looking like you want to go home. So you guys can read, on, read it in your own time. And if you want to ask questions afterwards, feel free to, feel free to do so. Um, thyroid function tests, the main thing with these is just know your HPT axis uh, because it's all just negative feedback. So uh, if you've got primary hyperthyroidism, things like <coughs> Graves, to toxic multinodular gonad, for example, toxic adenoma, um, all the T3 and T4 is going to be produced uh, independ uh, here in the thyroid which means T4 and T3 go up, and as a result of that, due to negative feedback, TSH is decreased. So you're looking for a decreased TSH there. However, in secondary, look, secondary, the secondary ones are pretty rare. You're unlikely to get examined on them, but it's just good in differentiating primary from secondary in general, because secondary is due, due to dysfunction in the pituitary, like a pituitary, pituitary adenoma or in the hypothalamus as well. So because the TSH is raised, that has the consequence of producing more T4 and T3. Again, and then it's just the opposite for hypothyroidism. So in primary, the thyroid's not producing much T4 and T3, and therefore as a result of that, there's less negative feedback to the pituitary and it produces, or to the hypothalamus as well, and it produces more TSH. And then secondary is pretty rare, but that's there as well. So lastly, we'll just uh, quickly summarize a few explanations for you guys. Um, in terms of a general format of the, ex like it, with, in terms of explanations, they're not so much about your knowledge, they're more about the way in which you can sort of transfer and communicate information. Um, so, you know, it's like you, you hear stories of people having absolutely no idea about the topic and just describing how to bake a cake or something. Um, and they can still get marks for that technically because they're still drawing diagrams. They're still <laughs> doing I, I, I don't, I don't recommend that. <laughs> but if absolute worst comes to worst, then that's something you can do. Um, so again, start with intro, consent, wash hands. Um, ask what the patient knows already because if they... <laughs> Because uh, if the patient already knows things, then you don't really need to explain it again. And also, it's really important to know what does the patient actually want to know. Like, um, in a very extreme example that you'll never get. Like, if the patient doesn't want to know the prognosis of a disease, and then you tell them, like, that's not a good scenario at all. So it's really important to assess sort of where the patient's at. Um, at the start, give a quick uh, a summary or a brief, uh, a brief outline of what you're going to talk about. So just signpost a few things. Just be like, OK, uh, in terms of your glucometer, for example, um, first I'm going to talk about your diabetes and why you need to be doing this. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, how to use the glucometer. Uh, then I'll explain to you a little bit about what the results mean. And then if you have any questions or concerns, I'll address them afterwards. Is that okay by you? Um, and by doing that, it helps the examiner to get an idea of what you're going to talk about. And it also helps you to structure your explanation as well. In terms of giving, giving information, you've heard it all before. You know, small chunks, no medical jargon, uh, use visual aids. Uh, one thing I found actually really, um, really effective is like before you go into the... Uh, before, in your like two minutes reading time, you can do this. That took three seconds. Here's a pamphlet. Uh, it's because it means that you won't forget it, and it means that the examiner clearly sees that you're handing over a paper, uh, handing it over. Um, of course, if you're like really into saving the trees, you can back down on that a little bit if everyone does it. But for the sake of your OSCEs, I'd recommend it. Um, <laughs> And then ask everyone to sort of repeat your information. Uh, also good to assess like the patient's actual beliefs, reactions, concerns, and you know all that HEP stuff, motivational interviewing, smart goals. Um, you've, you guys have done that so much, so I don't really need to cover that actually. Um, 
So explanation stations could honestly be anything. Like, there's absolutely no way to predict what you're going to get. Things such as PBLs, uh, glucometers, contraception, like glucometers, contraception, asthma devices, and potentially path results. They're, I guess, more common. Um, but on top of that, like, it could be anything. So I've attached a little thing of how to use a glucometer. Look, I've highlighted, like, that's most of what you need to know and what you need to do. So um, that's just something you can do in your own practice, in your own learning. Asthma devices, again, same thing. Um, I think you would have been shown these videos in your theme four tutes. Theme four, yeah. Um, like, you may remember the videos of some guy just do going through each step really slowly. Uh, if you want written instructions, they're here. Otherwise, I have got some written instructions in my own notes. If you would like me to send them to you, I'm happy to do that. Uh, the combined oral contraceptive pill. Uh, again, this is quite a complex explanation, and this one requires a bit more practice than the other ones. Um, so I guess some important things to highlight are that um, there's you know, the 21 hormone pills, seven sugar pills. Uh, there's three ways in which it works. It prevents ovulation, it prevents uterine implantation, and it thickens the um, cervical mucus. Uh, then you've got your 24-hour rule and your seven-day rule in terms of uh, forgetting to take the pill. Um, contraindications are quite important here. <coughs> so think, think mostly in terms of uh, clotting risk. So anything that increases your clotting risk is probably a contraindication for the pill. So things like uh, previous DVTs or PEs, uh, stroke or MIs as well. Um, if they're a heavy smoker and above 35, again, that just increases your risk of getting clots wherever they may be. Um, and then there's relative contraindications as well. And then you guys can run through that. Uh, also, don't forget about your procedures. Um, so we're, I've, we're almost done, uh, and it's almost been an hour and a half. So. That hopefully it will be just on time. Um, your analysis, just, you are expected to do this in about four, maybe five minutes. Um, it, you, need a, you, you should probably ideally practice this a few times. Because, um, again, it's not unheard of to get your analysis on an OSCE. So you just want to rush through it as quickly yet as effectively as possible. Uh, wash your hands, use your gloves, because no one wants to be touching we. Um, comment on the urine as well. So before you, um, <coughs> before you use the dipstick, hold it in front of you and say, again, what is in front of your eyes? What can you see? Like, is it a weird color? Uh, does it look really frothy or something? You may want to comment on the smell. Like, it, it's just apple.